and the first one is also from the US, like Anne that was here this morning. But in order to present him, we have first Julia, or Dr. Julia, who is the treasurer and a long time member of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. She also leads the headquarters in Kentucky, and I'll just leave it to her. Thank you, Julia. Good afternoon, and we're so glad you're all here for the 21st Biennial World Conference. Introducing Dr. Jonathan Plucker is a pleasure. Jonathan is the Raymond Neag Endowed Professor of Education at the University of Connecticut. His work focuses on educational policy and talent development, and he has been supported by more than $30 million in external grants and contracts. For his educational policy work, Jonathan has been ranked one of the top 100 most influential academics working in education for the last three years. Dr. Plucker was co-editor of the publication Critical Issues and Practices in Gifted Education, What the Research Says. And that publication provides the title for this keynote. I am very happy to welcome Dr. Jonathan Plucker. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Ah, uh -huh. you have to turn it on. It's a giftedness identification test that I failed in front of all of you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here uh, in this charming city. It's great to see so many old friends, and I've made so many new friends uh, uh, since, since we got here Sunday night. Um, so I'm really excited to give this talk. Um, I don't give it very often. So I really over-prepared for this bad boy. And around 11.30 last night, I was like, ah, it's perfect. I finally, the PowerPoint is perfect. And I was really proud of myself. Started drinking a glass of wine to get myself asleep, because I'm not used to the time yet still. And I was like, you know, I probably should check to see how long this is. I think, I think I've got about 50 minutes. And I had over 100 slides, which is about five hours worth of stuff. Um, so this is going to be a really long keynote for you, is really what the, what the no, I, we ch I chopped it down, and, and hopefully, hopefully this will be fun for all of us. Uh, uh, if you want a copy of all these slides, I'm happy to give them to you. Just email me. Uh, the last slide has every possible way that you can contact a person, and, um, so you don't, you don't need to take notes. Um, so here's what we're going to try to do today. Uh, just a little background. Why gifted education? The third bullet point is really the most important. Uh, and then the fourth, um, just kind of where I think the field is going in uh, the future, based on the work I'm doing with colleagues around the world. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a quiz, because we're all educators. What are the world's 10 largest countries by population? You know the biggest one, right? And the other one's a gimme. What's the third biggest one? I very clearly heard <laughs> Yes, you are all correct. People, even people in the US don't realize that we're the third biggest country. Much bigger than number four, actually. But a lot of these are surprising to people. Pakistan usually surprises people. Uh, Nigeria surprises people. That one, Bangladesh, really surprises people. One of the smallest countries by land mass, one of the biggest populations. Um, Russia, Japan, one of them is the fastest growing. Which one? Do you know which one is the fastest growing country of the mega countries? It's not Russia or Japan. They're the only two that are shrinking. It's not China, not, not, not even close. This country is growing, that's correct, this country is growing almost twice as fast as the next fastest country, and it's Nigeria. By 2050, um, and let's just assume we'll all be alive to see this, I hope you'll live long, happy lives, by 2050, Nigeria is going to be the third biggest country 
in the world. So when people say things like, why do we care about what's going on in Nigeria? Because in 20 years, everyone's gonna care a lot. Uh, the world is changing in interesting ways. How about this one? What percent, we live in a globalized world, right? We always talk about globalized world. The world's global now. What percentage of internet traffic actually crosses international borders? What'd you guess? If, if you don't start guessing faster, it's gonna be seven hours of keynote. You've really gotta, it's about 15%. Which some people go, of course, other people go, I thought it would be like 75 or 80 percent. Even with the internet, we still largely talk to each other within our own countries. Um, ooh, I like this one. How many people worked as smartphone designers in 2007? Seven, eight years ago, right? Not that long. None. 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 So an entire industry, forget how smartphones have changed everything we do, an entire industry that employs hundreds of millions of people around the entire globe, when you think about building the networks, maintaining the networks, building software, studying how well these things work, didn't exist seven or eight years ago. So when people say things to me like, well, you college kids need to be prepared for this job in 10 years. I think we don't even know what the jobs are going to be at that point. It's a very important point, I think. I had one more. Ooh, this is uh, one I recently learned from the U.S. National Science Foundation. What percentage of engineering majors actually work in engineering around the world? Because that, that's like one of the safest professions to go into, right? Go get a good engineering degree, get your engineering job, upper middle class lifestyle in almost every single country in the world. It's only 50% and 30% of that missing 50 say it's because there were no jobs. Uh, and so when we hear people say things like STEM is so important, is there a country on the planet where we don't say that? STEM, STEM, STEM. Or we call it STEAM to be artsy, but STEM, STEM, STEM. Uh, but that assumes there are unlimited STEM jobs. That's not necessarily the case. That's not necessarily the case. Um, this is one of my favorite charts. It's from the OECD. Uh, the exact numbers don't really matter. It just shows that over time, the requirements for success in jobs have changed. Have changed. Um, jobs today, especially professional jobs, require much more complex thinking, much more creativity, much more collaboration. Um, being able to communicate well with people, maybe not face-to-face -face anymore, right? In fact, probably not face-to-face -face anymore. Those routine manual, routine cognition types of jobs that lots of countries have survived on for a very long time, that's changing. That's changing. So, uh, the world is, uh, we aren't close to a globalized world. As much as people say globalism, gl globalization has changed everything, I could share a million other stats with you that show the globalization has just started. So as much as we think things have changed now, they're going to change tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold more. And we don't know what that's going to look like. We have no idea. The fact that China's currency devalued twice this week by less than 1%, has absolutely shaken up the world's financial markets. American airplane stocks have been hit the hardest, which made no sense to me until I thought about it a little bit. There's the small move in one important country's currency. Everyone around the world freaked out. They're worried about stock market crashes everywhere. That's just one little example how we've all starting to become interconnected. We're like 1% as interconnected as we will be eventually. The world is really changing. Um, although we aren't really close to what that, what, to what that world will be. Uh, more technology than we have ever had before. Things that used to be science and fiction 20 years ago, we have better technology today. It can be great. Dr. Robertson and I were talking earlier about, you know, Facebook is so great, social media is so great to be able to keep up with your friends and their lives and, and to be able to collaborate with colleagues. I was talking to someone else about how we're gonna set up some Skype calls. I've had that conversation 100 times this week with people. Let's Skype next week. Um, we couldn't do that before. 
Uh, but technology also has pretty bad downsides, right? Uh, we find, for example, that we think of this current generation of adolescents as being digital natives, right? We hear this a lot, oh, they're digital natives. They don't know a world without smartphones. They don't know a hyper-connected social media world. Uh, but what we find out in study after study is they only know how to use the technology to do certain things. They don't know how to use the technology to solve problems. They're not really good at using technology to do creative work. They're really good at using it for texting and social media applications. But there's limits there. So even things, things we think we know about technology are proving wrong. Uh, we're certainly returning to a bipolar world. I don't need to explain that. Um, a lot of countries that have been traditionally labeled developing, as far as I'm concerned, are fully developed. That changes the dynamics around the world. Um, uh, we're starting to see more economic equality among countries, but since most of them are using free market capitalism to do it, that tends to lead to more in inequality within countries. That's an important, important detail. And certainly immigration, migration patterns are changing. Um, immigration is a hot topic in most parts of the world now, right? Um, the biggest migration story, though, is probably China uh, over the course of a two or three generations moving about three quarters of a billion people from rural areas to urban areas. That is a huge shift with big implications for everyone in this room. Um, uh, just how people move around the world is changing. Um, and we, again, have no idea what the jobs of the future are going to be. The general idea, uh, but odds are we're probably wrong. Challenging. So the 21st century is certainly proving to be a brave new world. Things where we've traditionally thought were the valued skills, the valued outcomes, are kind of gone. Um, and a big piece of this rethinking is rethinking where talent comes from and how we can best promote it. And that's largely what I'm here to talk about today. Only five more hours to go. You guys are in great shape. You're hanging in there with me. I really appreciate it. Um, very, very quickly, um, uh, I did a policy brief for IEA, which is the um, Amsterdam, Hamburg-based testing group that does the TIMS test, PEARLS. Um, uh, that should come out any time. We hoped it would be out by today, but it would probably be next week, uh, where we actually look at academic excellence across every country that takes TIMS and PEARLS. Um, these are just, uh, the whole point here on these next few slides is that there's a huge range and the percentage of students across countries that perform at the advanced level. Huge range. Um, uh, Russia, England, US, it's between five and 10%. Uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, China, uh, it tends to be 30% or more. Um, uh, the details aren't terribly important. Um, the US actually does better in fourth grade, where we're usually among the world leaders, in the, by eighth grade in high school, we're considerably lower. Um, but the big thing is there's a, is a huge, huge landscape and difference. And no matter what the content area is, there's a very big spread. Um, and the numbers tend to bounce around a lot, which uh, no one can really, can really figure out. But uh, the takeaway here is there's a really big spread. Some countries are doing much better at this than others. So what, what do we know about promoting educational excellence? As uh, Julia said, um, it's based, a lot of what I'm talking about are based on that book on the left. There was a second edition that came out a couple years ago now uh, with another 70 plus chapters. Uh, many of those authors are in this room, thank you. Um, and then uh, Carolyn Callahan and I were asked to write a papal paper for the journal Exceptional Children about a year and a half ago where we kind of brought the big themes together. Um, uh, the funniest reaction that I had to the book, it's about, if you've seen it, it's about this thick. Um, uh, so I know no one has read it cover to cover. And uh, I was at Thanksgiving dinner, and one of my wife's uncles, during a quiet part of the conversation, said, Jonathan, I'm almost done reading your book. People literally were spitting dessert out on uh, the table. Um, and I was like, yeah, thanks, Hart, that was funny. Um, it, uh, uh, so we wrote a shorter version, which is this paper. 
Uh, and a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are um, here. I'm going to talk about three different types of things that we've pulled from reading all of these thousands of studies. Um, the first group is th where we, we, we really do know a lot. Um, the second group is where we're starting to get there. And the third group, as you can imagine, is uh, areas where we're generally a bit too confident in what we know and the research really doesn't back it up. I don't have time to walk through all nine of the things that I list, um, so I'm going to pick and choose selectively, uh, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards if I skip over. I'm going to talk about the first two on this slide. Uh, what doesn't happen in the regular classroom? Um, we have plenty of studies in many countries now that in the regular classroom, whether we say that differentiation happens or not, it generally doesn't. I'm not saying teachers aren't trying really hard. Uh, I'm just saying the research makes it pretty clear it's not happening to the extent that we all thought it probably would. So gifted students' needs, no matter how you define their needs, are not being met in the regular classroom. Um, and that's just because, in the end, differentiation is really, really hard. Really hard. I personally don't think we prepare teachers around the world to do it very effectively. And I think there are lots of things that we do, like getting rid of ability grouping wholesale, which makes differentiation harder. And so a lot of our structures of schools make differentiation very, very, very difficult. Um, and I, I just do this. I was looking for a really good graphic of a bored kid to put up here, and so I just Googled bored kid. It is telling. Just go ahead and do it. Google bored kid. Almost every picture is a school picture. Almost every picture is a school picture. I was like, this, this is ridiculous. Um, and this is going to be blurry that big, but those kids could all be dead for all I know. So I almost didn't use this one, but it proves my point. Um, so um, acceleration, another one. We have so many studies on all the different forms of acceleration. The fact that acceleration is even a question in many people's minds at this point is really, really surprising. I, I think it is to say it is one of the best supported interventions in all of education, period. Um, and we, the scary stuff is we've had really convincing experimental studies since the 50s and 60s. It's not like we've recently discovered that acceleration works so well. Um, Julian Stanley recently discovered it works so well by the late 60s. The fact is that in many countries, it's just socially uh, taboo within schools. It makes people nervous. Um, and of course, you run into the, well, we had one kid who skipped a grade and that didn't work out problem. Uh, well, yeah, did you do it well? Do they think it worked out well? I, it just becomes anecdotal evidence that we used to club acceleration to death. I mean, very well documented benefits. It's not perfect, of course. Um, but for lots of interventions, we really don't know what the downsides are. We know what they are, and they're minor. Um, it really is amazing that we don't do more with acceleration. Uh, a good example, historically, is um, early college entrance. Um, Martin Luther King started college at 16, and that was not considered shocking at all. When you were ready to move on to college at that period of time in American history, you moved on. A lot of countries have moved away from that now. If you have not seen the Nation Empowered report, and uh, Dr. Astley and I shamelessly stole your logo there, so I never didn't ask permission, I realized at 12.30 last night, but um, um, I'm assuming your nodding means that it's okay. Uh, uh, go to that link, download this great, great work out of the Bell and Blank Center, which really just does a very good job of summarizing this, just the volumes of information that we know about how to make acceleration work. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing more of it. When kids are ready to move ahead, they should move ahead. Areas where a solid uh, evidence base, uh, that should say, is emerging, just goes to show you, you can work on slides for 12 hours and still uh, mistype something. Um, I'm gonna talk about creativity and excellence gaps briefly here. Um, for creativity, I mean, it is amazing uh, the conceptual leaps that we've made in creativity. 
when I go to meetings in places like Washington, D.C., Beijing, I, uh, it used to be that we used to have to fight about, well, you guys can't even define creativity. And we finally convinced people that we've actually been defining creativity the same way for decades. People all around the world use the same basic definition. Uh, this really isn't rocket science. Uh, we know what we're talking about here. Um, part of it is that we started using the word innovation instead of creativity, and there's not a policymaker in the world who's going to tell you they're not interested in innovation. That's how we've end run around them with that. Uh, but some of the theories and conceptual models that we have coming out now, we can really understand a lot about how people produce creative things, how to help students produce creative things. Um, theory, definitions, conceptual issues that held us back for a, for a long time, are done for the most part. I mean, every year another exciting theory is coming out, but we're starting to see they're becoming more and more incremental, which tells me that we, we've, we've kind of circled this. Uh, and so we're, we've, we've really done a great job with this part. Um, assessment work and creativity has never been more vibrant. Uh, as much as people dismissed things like the Torrance test of, uh, Torrance test of creative thinking, um, the Torrance tests, um, and just diverging, divergent thinking assessments in general, um, uh, they were much maligned for about 20 years. You know, and then all this research started to come out that said that, you know, they're actually a pretty good indicator of future creative behavior. And a lot of countries are starting to use them now. But we've developed dozens of others. The big problem is we don't know how they scale up. So these are really good assessments to use with one or two kids or a classroom of kids or in a research study with 100 kids. But we have governments coming to us now saying, hey, do you have a uh, creativity assessment, uh, assessment that we can give to 20 million kids? And like they'll have just heard me speak where I say, we have great assessments. And then I have to say, for 20 million, absolutely not. And they go, what? It's like I, scaling up assessments is extremely difficult. That's really what creativity researchers, at least on the education side, are really focusing on now, is how can we get these things to scale up so we can use them on a grander scale, use them as outcomes for different interventions. If you're going to use standardized achievement test scores for outcomes for teacher evaluations, school evaluations, league tables in England and places like that, why not use creativity? Well, we really have to make sure that those measures are top-notch. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. We're a few years away. Um, and this is a theme that I'm going to come back to. We have a better idea of what doesn't increase creativity and what hurts creativity than we do interventions that really seem to support it. Um, so, for example, uh, group work and brainstorming. Who doesn't love a good brainstorming session? Most people actually don't like it. But um, uh, the dirty secret that only hundreds of studies across disciplines has found again and again and again is brainstorming almost always makes the group less creative. Almost always. Um, and uh, if you're a huge brainstorming fan, I know you're sitting there apoplectic going, no, but it works for me. You know, maybe it does, but for the vast majority of people, it really doesn't. We're not really sure why. Lots of different theories. Uh, I mean, so many studies have played with this. I, for the most part, people think it's uh, social, social dynamics. Um, and, uh, but in general, uh, we could do a huge group brainstorm here. We'd come up with lots of ideas. Woohoo! Uh, but if I gave you the same task and I sent you out separately, told you to come back a half an hour, one, it is so nice in this city, you probably wouldn't come back in a half an hour. But you'd come back like two hours later and you'd have more ideas and more creative ideas than if you sat in the room and did them together. Study after study after study has found that. And if you think about it, think about that last time you were sitting in a group trying to brainstorm ideas. Uh, it's very, very difficult. People get frustrated. You start going in this crazy direction and no one pulls you back. Um, it's just a very, very, very common problem. So we have a really good sense of what doesn't work in terms of creativity interventions. We don't have a, as solid of an evidence base as we really need about what we can do with students that really helps. Problem-based learning approaches, project-based learning approaches, for the most part, seem promising. 
Um, but a lot of that research hasn't focused on creativity as an outcome, so we're not really confident enough yet. So um, we're heading in the right direction. Um, excellence gaps, sim simply put, excellence gaps are just achievement gaps at the top end. Many countries are really concerned about the inequities in their educational system, um, sometimes by race, usually by uh, student and family income. So you have poorer students um, getting to that minimum competency level at a much lower rate than middle and upper class students. Uh, we're concerned about excellence gaps, which is those same group of students at the very top. Um, and what we find in most countries, uh, we did a study on this in high ability studies a few years ago, almost every country has excellence gaps and um, student, student family income, uh, very few of those students in any country um, actually achieve any sort of excellence, defined as very high test score performance. So we're doing better with middle and upper middle class students for the most part. Uh, with lower class students in terms of socioeconomic status, we're just not, we're just not helping them. This is true in every single country. Um, uh, that said, we think that excellence gaps are a better way to advocate for gifted education services when we work with policymakers in different countries, um, primarily because advocates traditionally use the these kids have special needs argument. And our problem with that has been there will always be another student group that has specialer needs, right? So, like, I've literally been in a U.S. senator's office and I've watched one group come in, talk about gifted education, and then you know, I'm sitting there waiting to talk to somebody else, and I realize that the next group in is the state's Parents of Autism organization. They're gonna make the, our kids have special needs argument too, and the senator's gonna forget that you gifted ed people ever existed, right? Um, we start playing the who has more special needs. I think that's why we traditionally struggle in terms of advocacy. We like the excellence gap argument because it really allows us to argue both equity and excellence. So you can say to the policymakers, where are your next innovators coming from? And at the same time, a state like California is about 46, 47 percent Hispanic students. Almost none of them score advanced on the national NAEP test. That's a huge talent pool that the world's seventh biggest economy isn't capitalizing on. Every country has this issue, all this talent that we're leaving behind. It's not good for the country. It's not good for the student and that student's community. Um, excellence gaps. I'm not gonna bore you to death with data from that because uh, many of you have heard me do it before, um, but I will, uh, and that link is on the last slide too where a lot, a lot of this work is. One thing that we did find that I think is fascinating in our second excellence gap report, one thing that we often hear, right, is the uh, rising tide argument. Well, if we focus on minimum student achievement, the rising tide is going to lift every single boat. One, that's not how boats work. Two, um, it turns out that it's not true. Uh, the numbers aren't important here. The fact is that the big blue number for each of the 50 states plus DC in my own country is the percentage, is the size of the excellence, I'm sorry, the size of the achievement gap at the bottom end by student family income. The maroonish line is the size of the excellence gap. They're not correlated at all. In fact, the correlation is zero. It's actually negative, negative 0 0.03. Um, so this rising tide argument that if we shrink, ex uh, if we shrink, sorry, shrink achievement gaps at the bottom end, um, uh, excellence gap at the top end are going to naturally shrink too. That may be true, but our estimate is the follow-on effect is literally 100 years, if not, if not longer. That's a long time to wait. Um, uh, so focusing on achievement gaps clearly does not help gifted students. So areas where practice outpaces available research, um, I think I'm gonna talk about all three of these. Uh, so I, I, we like to say that we know so much about gifted students' social and emotional development. Um, we have a lot of great descriptive research how does their self-concept change over time? How does their tendency towards perfectionism compare to students who um, 
don't have as much high ability. Um, what types of uh, social emotional coping skills do gifted students use? We've got really good studies on that, again, across the globe. Uh, the problem is we have very little intervention work to see if the types of programming that we do, to see if the types of counseling that we do um, really work and really help students develop these positive affective traits. Um, I'm someone who's done a lot of this work, and when we were reviewing all these chapters, we were like, oh my gosh, there's this hole. Where we, you know, you tell me, wow, these kids have really big self-concept problems, or they're dealing with this really big personal issue. What does the research say on how we can work with them? It's extremely thin, it really is, and there's not a lot of intervention work. Um, and then most of it that we do have is case study or very small sample size work, which is not surprising, right? Gifted students, by definition, are a small part of the overall student population. Those students with social and emotional difficulties are an even smaller percentage. So there's not a lot of students that, that we tend to study here. But the research does tend to be rather thin. I remember like 25 years ago, bibliotherapy was hot. And people said, oh, this is great. It's a personalized intervention. We find these books with characters who are dealing with the same problems. And then the gifted student will see how this character solves the problem, except for one thing. Well, intervention studies say it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It makes so much sense, though, right? It makes so intuitive that that would work. Well, it turns out it doesn't really work. Um, uh, Self-concept. We know so much more about adolescent, gifted adolescent students' self-concept. We know how it changes in different types of programs, but we don't really know whether that's a good or bad thing. We don't know if it leads to greater student achievement and creativity. We don't know if it inoculates them against self-concept and identity and image problems later. So we have these great snapshot studies, but we're not at the point where we can really answer the, here's how we help this student with this problem. And again, we have a better study of what not to do than we do what to do. That said, um, I was at a meeting uh, just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, um, at the U.S. National Academy of Science. And the topic was, in education in general, what interventions do we have that really seem to help students with these non-cognitive, non defined very, very broadly traits? Um, there were some smart people in that room, and there were very few studies in general. So in general, we have lots of good descriptive studies about these topics. We don't have great interventions yet. And if we do, they're on a very small scale. Um, and some, uh, some very interesting ones. Uh, so this collaboration versus group work versus agreeableness thing. Uh, so at that, at that um, National Academy of Science meeting, all these workforce development people came to us and said, survey after survey, around the world, people at these big companies tell us they want people who can work together in groups. That's usually like the first thing. Um, and they taught, we heard this from so many, survey after survey after survey, and they're right, that's what the surveys say. I think that that's not actually what they mean. Uh, when I've done workforce development work, they don't necessarily want people who can work together in groups, they want people who can collaborate. And that's not the same thing, right? People who can work together don't ever have to be in the same room with each other and produce amazing work. Sitting together in a room is technically only sitting together in a room. You don't, we don't need to do that anymore. And then a famous personality psychologist was there and he said, I just think this is all garbage. He said, isn't it really agreeableness? Employers want people who, when you walk to the water cooler on Mondays, can talk to you about the weather and are friendly and ask about your kids and grandkids and remember their names. Uh, it's not that they want people who can work in physical groups together all the time. They want people who aren't jerks, is really what it comes down to. They want nice people who can interact well with each other. That is so incredibly different from we have to train students to work in groups together. The research is pretty clear that around 30% of students do not do their best work in a group. No matter how you train them, no matter how you organize the group, they like to work by themselves. That doesn't mean that they can't collaborate. It means that they don't have to be in a group together. Some of you have heard me t t tell this story on Monday. 
I was in a uh, London advertising firm, and we were kind of looking at how they do create, you know, creative idea generation and things like that. And it was a really interesting discussion, and it was very clear that the way that they do it is everybody on the team gets together in the same room, and they will sit there for hours staring at each other and fighting to come up with some good ideas. And I said, well, you know, this actually isn't going to work very well. You're much better off sending people off into different directions and then circling back, and then giving them a new task and going out and bringing them together. And sort of scaffolding it like that, you're going to get much better ideas. And they're like, but we pride ourselves on collaboration. So it's still technically collaboration. You, just, you guys are just going to yell at each other a lot less. Um, and I swear this is true, as I was leaving their office that day, one of the graphic designers ran up to me and said, I, I, re I really need your help. I was like, okay, what is it? He's like, I, I, there's, this, there's this copywriter that I have to work with, and uh, there's this really big problem whenever we try to work together. And I said, well, what's the problem? And he goes, said, I hate her. <laughs> what do I do about that? I said, that's really not a problem for me to solve, buddy. Um, uh, but we actually talked about it, and I said, why are you sitting in front of the computer together trying to write together? Has there ever been a sentence written by people sitting at the keyboard together that has ever been good? If it is, it's because you each went out and edited it and brought it back, right? Writing together doesn't make any sense. Collaborating on writing does make sense. It's a very important distinction. I think we screw that up all, all the time. Um, <laughs> and, and, and at this National Academy meeting, we also talked about, like, mindset and grit is such a popular concept around the world, right? We have to get students with the right mindset. They have to be gritty. Um, you know, we've known for a long time that the personality characteristic that best predicts success in almost every line of work at every age is conscientiousness. Grit and mindset are just repackagings of a lot of those same terms. They're important. Uh, but this thing where we use different terms to describe the exact same thing is what has led to a lot of confusion. And, and I, most countries now have 21st century skills models. Uh, to, um, I can think of a dozen off the top of my head. Uh, your country is probably one of them. They call them different things, but they all look something like this, where uh, really trying to broaden the focus of outcomes on things beyond the uh, cognitive in our narrow definition of cognitive. Um, part of the problem, though, is that, again, we don't have great intervention work on how we actually get there with many of these. Seems like an intuitively good idea, but we're not 100% sure. Uh, race, poverty, and equity, uh, decades of, um, of um, attention in most countries. Uh, we've made some progress in terms of identification. How do you help racial minority students, disadvantaged minority students, low-income students? What's the best way to assess? We're not there yet. Um, a lot of people say we are, but we seem pretty far away. Um, I think that's pretty obvious. One of the silver, bur excuse me, silver bullets over the past 15 years has been nonverbal assessments. If we just take language out of it, language is such uh, a complicating factor, especially for low-income students. We're much better off if we use nonverbal assessments. The problem um, is that nonverbal assessments tend to identify almost exactly the same percentage of students from different groups as verbal assessments do. Um, I, that's controversial. Some people say they work great. There's a lot of evidence, though, that they don't work great, so we really aren't sure about them yet. Uh, and then again, a lot of the interventions that we have uh, to, to help improve the performance of these various student, student sub, subgroups across countries um, is really, really limited. And a lot of the interventions don't seem to work. Uh, but again, we have, um, uh, we, we, do, we do seem uh, to know what doesn't work. So uh, for example, about five years ago, there were a number of studies about positive affirmations that literally said, if you can get students to write a paragraph about why they're a good person and why they're smart, that that little intervention seems to carry on for months afterwards. The students do better in school, they have better self-image. It sounds like a fairy tale, right? It's like magic. They write a paragraph, but they also looked at it by student ability level. What's the one group it didn't work for at all? 
gifted students. Um, and so we have lots of studies like that of, oh, try this, it really works for most kids, except for gifted students. Oh, try this, it works really great for most kids. Well, probably not for gifted minority students. Um, so there's just these very big holes. Lots of people write a lot and make lots of recommendations about what could work. Our evidence of what actually works is much thinner, unfortunately. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to fly through this because it's boring. <laughs> Ability grouping. I've already given away my slide. Um, so when we started doing this work, uh, we just thought the conventional wisdom was 100% accurate, that ability grouping works very well for gifted students. And s some studies definitely lean in that direction. But what we generally found, we, we actually went back and reread all of these studies, because every chapter we've been given on this topic is really mixed. And we thought, but we thought that the uh, research was really clear. Ability grouping works. Uh, the line that I used to give principals, which I still kind of do, which is, um, I probably shouldn't though, is uh, they'll say, well, we don't believe in grouping students. And I say, oh my gosh, you don't, you don't, you don't have classes? Wow. That's, that's like craziness. And, uh, well, no, of course we have classes. I'll say, oh, so you meant you, you, don't, you don't do some kinds of grouping, you just do arbitrary age-based grouping. And they, they get stuck on the arbitrary word, which is mean on my part. Um, but we have to group students, right? So you can't have a school of 700, 800, 2 to 3,000 students and have them in one gigantic room. So we're acknowledging that we have to group them in some way. Ability grouping has just been off the table. Um, Oh, that was a great, uh, I was evaluating a gifted program in uh, the middle of the U.S. and I was interviewing the middle school principals, very large school district. Um, there were, were several of them. And they say, oh, we love our math program. And I was like, all right, tell me about it. And they're like, everyone loves it. We have these bluebirds, we have the cardinals, I forget what the other birds were, I'm not a bird person. Mockingbirds, pterodactyls, I don't know what it was. And, um, and so they were, you know, talking, and I was like, oh, okay. And they were like, oh, but you know, in language, we don't, it's just you know, the same class for everybody. And I was like, oh, so ability grouping has worked for you. The principal leading this group, I really thought he was having a heart attack. He just immediately, he literally grabbed his chest and said, dear God, don't use the word ability grouping. We would never do that. I was like, okay, so you're just dividing them roughly by ability and the pace at which they move through the material. He was like, yes. Whew. It's like, all right, we're done here. Um, uh, part of the, and I guess one way to look at this research is that if you go back and actually read the studies that are very negative about ability grouping, the research is not nearly as negative as it has subsequently been interpreted. And if you go and look at the studies that we all, including myself, cite ad nauseum about how perfectly it works, the original study isn't as positive as we remember it either. It's shades of gray. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that much of this research is from the late 80s and early 90s now. And while it pains some of us to admit that that is ancient history, that's a long time ago. That's like two generations of students have come and gone. That's how old a lot of that research is. We really need better research. I shouldn't say better. Those studies were very well done. We need more contemporary research. We need a lot more of it, and we need it across cultures. It's a very monocultural, like, that's the wrong word. Um, I think this is a really important point, though. I think why it's mixed is because it doesn't matter if you're grouping students if you're not doing appropriate things in the classroom, right? I mean, everyone here knows this. I'm preaching to the choir. But to a lot of policymakers, that's, I've had this conversation with so many policymakers where they say uh, charter schools or uh, in the Netherlands, uh, community schools. Right? I mean, there's, there's all these different names we have for these special types of schools. Um, everyone has them now in all kinds of spe special types of schools. Uh, and the school, it, that's going to solve the problem. But the, mo the more important question is what's going to happen inside the school? 
You're gonna make these stru structural reforms. You're gonna implement ability grouping. Awesome. What actually happens in the ability groups? If, if they're just doing harder worksheets, I would argue it's not gonna work that well. Um, if you create a new school, a new STEM, STEM schools are very popular, a new STEM school, and they will all become scientists and go to Mars and things like that. But then you do the same type of curriculum you do in the non-STEM school, why would you expect different outcomes, right? And yet we find this again and again and again. And this is really difficult because structural reforms are catnip for policymakers around the world. And it makes sense, right? They can't control what happens inside the school, inside the classroom. They try every day, we know that. But they really can't. They can control structural issues. So they can ban acceleration, or they can promote ability grouping, or they can create charter schools, or they can get rid of specialized schooling. That's because they can control that. But as educators, it's us to up, then go in and clean it up, and make sure that what's actually happening in those reforms is what is actually going to change things. So if you want to ability group, great, but you really have to ability group and differentiate. You can't just put students in different rooms and do the same old thing. That is generally what we think is happening. That said, this research is 30 years old now. So some random thoughts on the future. I am nailing the time. You really thought I was gonna do five hours, didn't you? I am right on 50 minutes. Um, I'm never right on, Julia can tell you, I'm never right on time. Um, the field really needs to be share more, uh, excuse me, needs to be sharing more about what appears to be working. I mean, I have had great conversations with people this week about things that are going on in Poland, Australia, Hungary, uh, the Netherlands. They have awesome conversations about things people are trying. Um, that's why get-togethers like this are so incredibly important. We need to be learning from each other. What looks promising? Um, what may work in different cultures? What may not work in different cultures? We don't have enough of that in this field. But then, once we hear about these things, we need to try them, and we need to evaluate them, and essentially we need to be trying to replicate them across cultures, across different, different country lines, across different neighborhoods to see if they will actually work. Um, we've done several studies on the science of replication. It's a hot topic in psychology and education around the world right now. Uh, gifted education um, had one of the lowest replication rates. So people try something, and either it works or it doesn't work, and we move on. We don't actually try it again to see if it worked in a different setting with a bigger student population or a different student population, or try to improve it again. We kind of declare victory or declare defeat and move on after one initial small-scale study. That's a big problem for this field. Um, we still need better data systems. Um, we don't have, many countries now have pretty good data systems. Being able to track how well students are doing in terms of a, a narrow slice of student achievement scores. Uh, the creativity measures, the other non-cognitive non measures are not fantastic. So we need to get, one, better measures, that's researchers' jobs, and then we have to be trying these out with educators, and then we need to be picking the best ones and making them part of those data systems. Uh, that will really help gifted and talented students. And then we need a vastly improved sense of how policymakers interact with gifted education. Um, I think it's safe to say, arguably, that the United States is probably the country where national level policymakers meddle the least with the local classroom decisions. And Americans hate any meddling whatsoever. Uh, but it's a lot more in other countries, uh, especially centrally planned education systems. We're, we're not really sure how a lot of those policymakers' decisions and understanding of the local classroom, of the, excuse me, of the local classroom context for gifted students really impacts the decisions they make that filter down to the classroom. We need a much better sense of that. Uh, we just did a study just within the, uh, excuse me, just within the U.S. for the Jack Kent Cooke Foundation. We looked at all 50 states, um, and we looked at policies, and we also looked at student outcomes in an effort to see uh, which states seem to be doing better with this. And there were a handful of states that are doing better than average. Um, and when we did case studies of those states, we found some intriguing things. People said, well, you know, the reason that our state does a really good job is because in our State Department of, e of Education, essentially the State Ministry of, of um, Education, 
uh, there's one person there who really knows gifted education well. And they're a tremendous advocate. They know how to work with politicians. They know how to work with teachers. You've got to have that one person. That, we, we, we were told that in every single of those eight really positive states. We were also told, and I think this is really interesting, um, that the local consultants and the local university faculty um, have a wide ideological breadth. So they're not focused on just one theory or one model that you need to be using in your state schools. It's a diversity of different approaches seems to matter. That's a preliminary study. We're following it up this fall. The interesting thing for us, though, is that we're finally starting to scratch the surface a little bit on what, at a certain level, what type of work can be done that helps you serve the needs of these kids. Um, as I like to say, uh, a lot of people, when I, when I start talking about policy, their eyes glaze over. Um, maybe it's just me. But their eyes glaze over, and then they say, I'm not really a policy person. And I say, if you care about kids or you're involved in education, you are by definition a policy person. Because policy defines the rules that we use to teach our children. Um, we've kind of ignored that whole layer in gifted education, and we're slowly starting to fill in those gaps. In every country, we, we absolutely need, need to be learning more about those things. Um, at the same time, one cool thing about traveling the globe is just talking to educators. I, slowly but surely, policymakers are starting to come around to the fact that gifted education and talent development is really important. We have not converted everyone. There will always be some, but I'm really sensing sort of groundswells of policymaker support in many countries where I thought we'd never see it before. Um, so I think this is a very positive, exciting time. Because if we can get more of them on our side, boy, it's going to be a lot easier to do the hard things that you do every day. Um, but most importantly, uh, if you've read these gigantic books, what we know about, it, about gifted education, we know a lot. We do not give ourselves enough credit for that. We know a lot about gifted education and talent development. Uh, I pointed out some of the holes that we really need to fill, but I don't want the fact that we know a ton uh, to get lost. Um, we have learned so much in the past 50 to 60 years. Um, and then I think this, again, I don't want to beat this to death, but I think this is really important. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, if you went to graduate school and gifted education, anywhere in the world, you really were learning about a, one specific model when you went to graduate school. You went to go study with professor so-and-so, who's, who's, this, is, this is their model, and it works really well for them. That's what you're going to learn. I, I really see a shift in that across the globe now, um, in that people are really going and learning about all these different interventions, some which work in some context better than others. Um, that, to me, is the most exciting part of this, in part because that is the sign that the field is maturing and taking it to the next level. We really are getting close to a science of gifted education and talent development. Uh, and on that note, that should be my contact information. Questions? Questions? I have left you three minutes for questions. So they are going to be excellent, concise questions. Ah, oh, Jim, the first one. This will be good. <laughs> um, given the general negativity toward ability groupings yeah. and a general positivity toward differentiation, how do they react? I suspect you've done this before. How do they react if you just articulated ability grouping as a between class? Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Or point out if you did the ability grouping, it would make the differentiation more uh, That's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, we have just started to make that argument to policymakers in that um, the ability grouping thing, that is just for whatever reason, antipathy toward ability grouping is so ingrained in people. Um, I mean, I consider myself a passionate believer in things. I've never believed as strongly in something as people hate ability grouping. I just don't get it. Um, uh, I'm a New York Mets fan. I guess that's the only other windmill charging thing I do in life that I'll never give up. And it's the same thing. They just hate ability grouping so much. So again, we started to think, what's a different message? 
you bring up differentiation. Every principal and superintendent rolls their eyes. He literally goes, oh, what do we do? And I was like, you know, maybe whole class grouping is making it harder. Have you thought of that? And, and really turn it, like you said, into a contextual discussion. Um, we do see light bulbs go off. Interestingly, the people who are most receptive to that, in my experience, within our uh, country, uh, state school chiefs. For others, essentially, our 50 states each have their own superintendent of education, minister of education. Um, they're so frustrated by how hard differentiation is when they really thought it was gonna be the silver bullet. Um, and so you start talking about ability grouping as a differentiation tool they're actually, they're, they come around very, very quickly. So um, I think a lot of people are trying it. We don't know if it's that effective. Very good question. Your question was much more concise than my answer. Yes, I guess was the answer to your question. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And Jonathan, we thank you very much for posing some provocative questions for us. Thank you.